Folks, beating the stock market is a lot more important than people realize. Just 1% or 2% greater return on an annualized basis can make a world of a difference throughout your investing career. And so in this video, I'm going to show you how the math works out for just beating the market by 2%. And then I'm going to give you 5 tips on how you can beat the stock market on your own. Keep in mind, this video assumes that you don't have somebody else managing your money. And therefore, you don't have restraints over what kind of stocks you can pick. And number two, this also assumes that you're going to be actively investing and not passively investing. If you guys don't know, a really quick definition of passive investing is to follow a benchmark. So for example, when somebody says, hey, I'm going to beat the market this year, what they're saying is they're going to beat the returns of the S&P 500. I'll put up the index for you guys to see right now. Now, there are certain ETFs you could buy, such as ticker symbol SPY, which actually tracks the S&P 500. This would be known as passive investing because you will always get the same returns as the market, more or less, because the SPY ETF tracks the S&P 500. So assuming you don't want to passively invest, you want to actively invest in your own stocks to possibly beat the stock market, this is the video you want to watch. Keep in mind that the S&P 500 returns 10% on average for the past many decades. So that is going to be the number that we really use to track the market. Keep that in mind because it comes up in this upcoming example speaking of which here's the example folks one thousand dollars compounded at an annual growth rate of just eight percent will yield you ten thousand and sixty three dollars at the end of a 30 year window let's keep that 30 year window and the same one thousand dollars invested initially except now let's bump up the kager just two percent to ten percent per year now this will yield you seventeen thousand four hundred and forty nine dollars at the end of the same window now let's do the same thing one more time where we keep the time window at 30 years and the same initial $1,000 invested, except now the Kager is going to be 12%. This yields you $39,116 at the end of the 30 year window. Well, let's look at the difference between all of these returns. And yes, I'm going to show you that 2% difference makes a huge difference difference. So if you had a 10% Kager over that 30 year period, you would have received 1.73 times your money than if you got an 8% Kager. Now, if you got a 12% Kager versus a 10% Kager, you would have gone 2.24 times your money at the end of the 30 year window. Now, this is going to be the astonishing number that I think some people might drop their jaw to. If you got a 12% Kager versus an 8% Kager, the most extreme difference we have in this example, you would have 3.88 times more money at the end of that 30 year window. So why am I saying this? I am saying this because it's very easy to get the same returns as the market. It's called buying the S&P 500 ETFs, such as again, SPY. I'll put it up again for you guys to see. Now, if you buy that, you're going to get a 10% return on average on an annualized basis because it's going to track the S&P 500, or in other words, it's going to track the market. However, since most people are going to underperform the market if they actively manage their portfolios, it might be a good idea to just passive invest and try to get the same return as the market, which again is 10% on an annualized basis. But let's say that you want to take a risk because you know that just getting a 2% greater return in the market can yield you a lot more money in the future. Well, this is who that video is for. It's for those folks who are willing to take the risk of underperforming the market because they think they have a chance of outperforming the market. So that being said, here's the format. Tip number one is going to be to look at companies with pricing power. Tip number two is to find companies that are low margins right now, but are moving towards higher margins. Tip number three is to not overthink your investment. Tip number four is to find companies that can do great things five years ahead, but the analysts aren't looking at yet and not considering. Tip number five is to look at companies that you like and use their products and understand if their products have any meaningful impact. That being said, let's go a little bit more in depth on all of those tips for you guys. All right, folks, starting off tip number one with companies that have high pricing power. I'm going to give you guys two stocks to consider as case studies in this video. First one is going to be Skywork Solutions and the second one's going to be Altria stock. Now, starting off with Skywork Solutions, Skyworks is a company that makes 
chips for companies such as Apple, such as Google, such as Tesla. They make 5G chips and they made 4G chips before that and 3G chips before that. Now, if you look at a graphic that they show in one of their presentations to shareholders, we see that they show that a 4G phone would create $18 in revenue. So if they supply the chips for a 4G phone, each phone will give them $18. However, with 5G, each phone now has an opportunity of $25 per phone. Meaning, even if the companies that Skyworks supplies sells less phones, meaning let's say Apple or Samsung, even if these companies sell less phones, Skyworks can still probably make an increase in revenue just based on the fact that they're charging more per phone because Skyworks is selling more products and more chips per phone now than before. This puts Skyworks in a really great place as a shareholder because you know that even if the overall markets are suffering, Skyworks might actually make an increase in revenue or earnings just based on the fact that they have pricing power. Now let's move on to Altria stock and explain how that company also has pricing power. If we look at Altria, cigarette volumes have been declining since the 1950s, and while Altria is a cigarette maker in the United States. Nevertheless, guys, Altria has actually returned 10,000% excluding dividends to shareholders since the 1980s. This means that Altria found a way to increase their prices in such a way to keep consumers coming to them and to make sure their shareholders get some free cash flow going to them and to make sure that they don't go bankrupt. This is a beautiful thing, guys, and companies like this of great pricing power are able to survive even when all odds are against them. All right, guys, tip number two is to look at stocks of low product gross margins that are moving towards products of higher gross margins. Given the stock price does not reflect that this company is going through this change of higher gross margin. If you don't know what margins are, margins are essentially how much profit you can make per dollar of revenue. So if you make 30 cents per dollar of revenue, that's a 30% profit margin. Now there are also gross margins and stuff like that, but don't worry about that too much. The point is higher margins are better than lower margins. Now there are two case studies I want to point to in this video for this example. Number one is going to be Apple stock and number two is going to be Anheuser-Busch. Let's first start off with Apple stock. Last year in 2019, Apple saw their iPhone sales decrease for the first time in a long time. And this decrease came with a huge drop in the stock price. Now what investors didn't really realize was even though their iPhone segment of their business was declining, the services segment and the other segment of Apple's business were increasing at a pretty fast clip of about 15% per year. Now why is this so important? Well remember how we talked about margins and how higher margins are better than lower margins? The price fell so much that the margins were no longer factored into the share price. What do I mean by this? The hardware business of Apple, meaning their iPads, their Macs, their iPhones, only had a gross margin of about 33%, but their services segment had a gross margin of 64%, almost double that of their hardware business. So even though that their business with a higher margin was increasing at a rapid rate, people were only looking at the iPhone sales and only looking at the iPhone decline. That is crazy to me. And so I bought the stock and Apple is just becoming more and more profitable every single year because their high margin businesses are taking over. And this is making me richer as an investor. Now let's move on to Anheuser-Busch and give you another case study of how higher margins are better. Anheuser-Busch is a beer company. And once beer sales went down a little bit in the United States, people were freaking out and selling Anheuser-Busch. Along with that, Anheuser-Busch cut their dividend but their dividend was actually fairly safe. They did it so they could pay off their debt faster. That being said, I thought the reason they were selling off Anheuser-Busch was unjustified. So I looked at the stock. And what I realized was people weren't leaving beers to go to water. What people were doing was leaving mainstream cheap beers to move to premium beers and to move to non-alcoholic beers and other forms of alcohol. But all of the segments consumers were moving to were also owned by Anheuser-Busch. What's also amazing is that the segments that consumers were moving to also had higher margins because they're premium beers that cost more money to buy. What people also didn't realize was that 70% of Anheuser-Busch's products went to emerging markets, meaning markets where people are a little bit poorer, meaning markets where people can't really afford the same premium beers. Now, this essentially means that as these emerging markets come up, which they're expected to do in the upcoming decades, Anheuser-Busch is able to increase the prices of their products, which gives them pricing power, but they're also able to move the consumers in those emerging markets to more premium 
products again increasing their margin in these markets as well so these are a couple of things that people didn't realize that made me a pretty good return on anheuser-busch even though i've only held it for less than half a year all right folks tip three don't think too hard don't be overly analytical now what you want to do is look at a company and ask yourself basic questions but you don't want to ask yourself hmm i wonder why this company lost 50 basis points in their gross margin that's a waste of time Honestly, just look at what the business is doing overall and invest in that business if you like it. Asking these overly analytical questions is why so many people lost money on Tesla stock. They were freaking out over the fact that Tesla sold less cars one year than another year. And what they didn't realize was, hey, they sold less cars, but really their cars are still the best cars out there. To act like Tesla lost some sales because their business is now terrible all of a sudden overnight is a dumb assumption. Over analytical people are going to lose money in the stock market. Look at the basic facts, look at what matters, and then make your opinion off that. If you look way too into a company, you'll always find a reason why you shouldn't buy it. The same way people found a reason not to buy Apple stock when their iPhone sales plummeted. The last thing I want to say on this is that economists really don't know what's going on. Don't listen to them. Don't try to look at GDP figures. Who cares? You shouldn't care at all what's going on in the country. Our country has returned pretty consistently no matter what period we were in. Whether we are in the Great Depression or whether we are in World War II, at the end of the day, over a long time period, stocks return pretty much the same amount on an annualized basis in every single timeline in our history so don't be over analytical if an economist says the unemployment rate will be 20 percent in this upcoming month like they said for this last month guess what they were wrong about that don't just listen to people who are saying things try to do your own research and try to make sense of it with your own mind and your own thoughts that being said let's move on to tip number four tip number four is to look five years ahead at what the company is doing and try to predict what analysts don't even see coming yet tesla is a great example for this if you look at tesla over the past five years go five years back to 2015 and look at now what they're trying to do you'll be like god dang tesla's doing a great job so now let's look five years ahead to 2025 and try to predict what tesla's going Going to do as a case study to make this point now Tesla is a car manufacturer right now but in five years I see them using their solar power companies or renewable energy company and segment of their business to actually become an electric utility company on top of that I see them making cargo planes I see them making cargo ships I see them making trucks motorcycles ATVs railroads electric airplanes right all of these are in the realm of possibility because Tesla's mission is to make everything electric and to make everything renewable so you have to ask yourself okay what is their goal five years from now if you ask an analyst today imagine this go up to a JP Morgan analyst and say hey man what do you think about Tesla airplanes they're most likely going to say they don't have airplanes. What are you talking about? And that is why analysts statistically do not make a good return over the long run in the stock market because they don't think five years ahead. They might think at the very most one or two years ahead. One or two years ahead. They work on a quarterly basis. And so that's why I hate analysts. And that's why I tell you, don't be too analytical in tip three, right? Look five years ahead. Look at the basic facts. What is this company going to do in five years? Do I like what this company is going to be in 10 years, five years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years? Okay, if I do, I want to buy it. I know that was a really quick tip, but now let's move on to tip number five. All right, guys, finally, tip number five, use the products of the companies that you're investing in to understand the real meaning and the real use of their products. There are some companies that I really don't understand, even though I invest in companies that do almost the same exact thing. For example, Twitter. I don't really get Twitter. I don't have a Twitter. I don't care for Twitter. Whenever I made an account on Twitter, I ended up never using and forgetting the password. Twitter is a platform that I really don't care for. And so even though Twitter and Facebook are virtually the same type of company, I am invested in Facebook because I understand Facebook and I use Facebook and I use Instagram and I understand the true power that it holds. When I look at Twitter, I don't know what power Twitter really holds. I get that it's used for politics, but in reality, is it really a platform that people use besides getting news from big uh, public figures I don't know I really don't know because I don't use it and therefore if I was a Twitter investor I might consider trying to get some friends on Twitter following some people on Twitter and really starting to get engaged with it to understand their business model I was a Disney shareholder and oh my goodness when I was at my college dorm during the college year holy mackerel were people running back and forth saying let's go watch Disney plus 
Dude, I watched so much Disney Plus, my eyes were about to fall out of their sockets because I was tired of watching TV. Disney Plus, I saw it, I'm like, okay, this is going to become the next Netflix. And so I held on to that stock knowing it's going to become a big portion of their business. So guys, do the same for the stocks you own and you might actually be able to uh, spot mistakes or spot new trends before anybody else does. And also I want to add on, a lot of the analysts in Wall Street, and I mentioned this in the last video too, but a lot of the analysts are old white males. And not that there's a problem with any of that, but the problem is that that's a very specific demographic. They don't understand teenagers, they don't understand trends, they don't understand young people, they don't understand women, they don't understand Hispanics or minorities, they don't understand low income earners because usually finance people are high income earners. There's a lot they don't understand. So you can use your knowledge to, to really understand the importance of certain products that they will never understand. All right, folks, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, hit the like button down below, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to the right. Also share with your friends, your family, your pet bird, your pet lizard, your fish, your dog, your pet tarantula, your pet snake, whatever else you have. Because guys, that really helps as a small YouTuber. That being said, I hope you guys go out there, take some action, beat the market. Do what you gotta do, baby. Get that wealth. Let's become billionaires together. That being said, this has been Let's Become Billionaires. Have a great day, folks. Bye-bye.